De'Aaron Fox gets ejected. Tyrese Halliburton is out in health and safety protocols. Marvin Bagley's hurt again, and the Kings lose to the Houston Rockets. Happy Sunday. Welcome to the Locked On Kings podcast. You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked on Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. If you're looking for in-depth analysis, game-by-game breakdowns, highlights, interviews with local and national experts, full coverage of your Sacramento Kings from January through December, this is the place for you, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I've been a Sacramento sports media member for the last seven years. This is my eighth season covering Kings basketball, formerly for Sports 1140 KHDK Radio in Sacramento, now with ABC 10 News and Television. And the Kings got two big blows of bad news before the Kings and Rockets matinee performance on Sunday. Number one is that Marvin Bagley would miss the game with shoulder soreness after his best game of the season, which is really poetic in so many ways. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on in the podcast. Number two, and the biggest blow of all, Tyrese Halliburton has entered NBA health and safety protocols. No word on if he's had COVID, uh, no word on if he's just been around someone who did have COVID tested positive. Who knows? Regardless, Tyrese Halliburton missed this game and is going to be out for a little while now that he is in health and safety protocols. And then during the game, that got off to a horrendous start for the Sacramento Kings. They battled back, had a phenomenal third or second quarter, looked like that they were well on their way to winning the game. It wasn't a blowout by any means, and their lead wasn't comfortable, but they had a good chance. They were the better team against a, a struggling Houston Rockets team who's the worst in the Western Conference. And De'Aaron Fox is issued a flagrant two on a hard foul. And I will admit it was absolutely a hard foul um, on the uh, the Rockets guard, Garrison Matthews. It absolutely was a hard foul. And I would be okay had that review resulted in De'Aaron Fox being called for a flagrant one because he did wind up. Now he was going for the ball and you, if you watched on television, you could see De'Aaron's lips the entire time saying, Hey man, I was going for the ball. He went up to multiple uh, referees saying I was going for the ball and I got ball. And if you go back and watch the replay, De'Aaron Fox clearly does get the ball, but he also goes through the arm uh, of uh, Matthews in order to get to the ball. So, It's definitely a foul. I would have been okay because of the amount of contact, the wind up and the hard fall with Matthews uh, or with De'Aaron Fox rather being issued a flagrant one, which I thought was going to be the call all the way. But I was very surprised by a flagrant two. Very surprised. Now it's not unheard of. It's not absurd. It's not worth getting pissed off about, even though that play is probably the reason why, and De'Aaron getting ejected is probably the reason why the Kings ended up losing this game to the Rockets, uh, 118 to 112. It's not the most egregious flagrant to an ejection call uh, that I've seen. That being said, I do not think it was a flagrant two at all. I think De'Aaron had a point in saying that he was going the ball. I get the wind up, and every time there's a wind up, uh, I know that that's going to be taken into consideration, which obviously it was here in this review. Uh, what's important to note is that when these flagrant uh, foul reviews are happening and these flagrant fouls are called, intent doesn't matter. So whether or not De'Aaron Fox intended to hurt Matthews, which he absolutely did not, whether or not he intended to go for the ball and block the shot, that doesn't matter. It's all about the contact and whether or not the contact is excessive. And I did believe that the contact was excessive enough, like I said, for a flagrant one. It was a hard foul, maybe a little over the top, but not so excessive for De'Aaron to be kicked out of the game to be really putting Matthews in significant danger. Now, I know Matthews had a hard fall. And also, after the play, De'Aaron Fox went up to Matthews, apologized. They they high-fived, shook hands, and said, look, that wasn't my intention. I was going for the ball. I didn't mean to hit you that hard. But I just thought it was, I thought it was over the top, an unnecessary flagrant too. And just to prove that I'm not just saying that because I'm a Kings homer and 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 I, I support De'Aaron Fox and had it been the other way, I would have absolutely uh, called for a flagrant two for De'Aaron. 
when Joe Ingles of the Utah Jazz was called for a flagrant two on his hard foul on Davion Mitchell. If you remember, it was the second game of the season. It was the home opener when Joe Ingles got up underneath Davion Mitchell, who was going for a dunk uh, and uh, hit him in the legs and he fell. I personally felt that that was not a flagrant two, although I understand that being called a flagrant two more than this one because at that point, there was a major risk factor with Ingles taking out the legs and getting underneath uh, Mitchell. And, and Mitchell's head came centimeters from cracking off the ground. That's one thing. But how Matthews fell, he fell hard on his back, hard on his tailbone. I get that that's painful. I get that that can be dangerous. Significantly less dangerous than a guard who is way up in the air and is defenseless getting his legs taken out from underneath him. There's a big difference between the two. And I would have even been okay with Joe Ingles not being issued a flagrant two there. So this is not just a De'Aaron Fox homer thing. I thought the call was egregious. And unfortunately, it resulted in the Kings losing. The Kings without De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton for the fourth quarter, even if they're against the Houston Rockets, who are one of the worst teams in the NBA. It doesn't matter. The Kings are going to ha have a hard time winning without those two. And they needed more. They needed more out of those other guys that needed to step up in those moments. Offensively, the Kings did fair enough in that fourth quarter to win the game. Defensively, though, they gave up 33 points. The Kings couldn't get a stop. They gave up 63 points in the second half. That can't happen. That can't happen regardless of who's on the floor. The Kings had good enough personnel to beat the Rockets. Not most teams with De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton now. But in this game, with Harrison Barnes and Buddy Heald still in the game, still on the floor, Davion Mitchell out there taking over point guard duties, the Kings are good enough to win that game. They just have to get a stop on defense which they were not able to do. Something that they were able to do a lot in the second quarter when they overcame a horrific start. They were down 29-21 after the first quarter. Uh, they were down 16 points at one point in the second quarter, went on a massive run, including a 12-0 run, uh, and ended up outscoring the Rockets 39-26 in a second quarter very reminiscent of the third quarter they went on in their win over the Lakers a couple of games ago. But the reason why they went on that run, how they got that run started, was playing well on the defensive end, getting stops and getting out in transition. They couldn't get any stops in the fourth quarter. Not a single stop. You need more than 12 points from Harrison Barnes. Chemezi Metu did what he could with 14 points. Terrence Davis had a pretty good game with 17 points, although the starting lineup of Fox, Davis, Metu, Barnes, and Holmes was rough. Did not work at all. Buddy Heald was the Kings' leading scorer. He had a very efficient 27 off the bench, 5 of 9 from three-point range, 9 of 16 from the field. Love that from Buddy. I was pretty much 100% okay with everything that Buddy did in this game. Took a couple of like, oh, Buddy, here we go again shots. But I've just come to expect that and can pretty much live with that on a on a night-to-night -night basis, especially if he's shooting five of nine from three-point range and he's not reaching double digits in threes. And I'm okay with him not going over double digits in free threes, even with De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton out. I think that's good. I think that's more efficient for him and a reason why he had as good of a game as he had. But you need more. And then Rashawn Holmes made his return, which we're all very excited about. Rashawn uh, missed some time with... He's missed a decent amount of time. He first injured his eye... Um, a, a little over a month ago. And then he comes back. Then he had his eye scratched again. Uh, and then now he's wearing goggles because of that or glasses because of that. Uh, misses a, a fair amount of games with that, like six games or something like that. Comes back, plays like game or two, and then goes into health and safety protocols and he missed a big chunk of time. We know how important Rashawn Holmes is to the Sacramento Kings. And all things considered, I think Kings bigs, particularly Damian Jones, I think he did a pretty good job, and the Kings did a pretty good job of weathering that Rashawn Holmes storm. Not great. You definitely don't turn your nose up of, at having him back, but I thought the Kings did a relatively good job, and I wanted to give him credit there. That being said, Rashawn needs to definitely work himself back into game shape with the amount of time that he's missed, and he needs to work himself back into understanding the flow of how to play with this Kings team because he only played 15 minutes had four points, did shoot two of two from the field, but only two shot attempts and zero rebounds. Zero rebounds in 15 minutes. That's inexcusable as a starting center. And I know, again, all excuses on the planet for him trying to work his way back into game shape and battling COVID and battling, I don't know if he had COVID in particular, but he was health and safety protocols, battling the eye injury. Like he has a lot of excuses. But zero, zero rebounds cannot happen, especially for a team that struggles with rebounding. And, of course, for the a millionth time, it feels like, not just this season, but in the recent history of the Sacramento Kings, they were destroyed on the offensive glass, gave up far too many second-chance opportunities, including a second-chance opportunity that allowed the Rockets to ultimately put this game away. 
Uh, the Rockets had a, a total of only four offensive rebounds, to be fair. So the Kings weren't absolutely crushed on the offensive glass, but when it mattered, they couldn't secure defensive rebounds, and that's something that has haunted this team for a long time. The Rockets shot almost 54% from the field, 40% from three-point range, 83% from the foul line. They had a strong offensive game. The Kings defensively uh, couldn't do anything. And the Kings managed to still lose a game in which they scored 34 points off of 23 Houston turnovers. You're scoring 34 points off of 23 turnovers and still losing the game? That's impressive in all the wrong ways. The Kings really could have used Marvin Bagley tonight. Really could have used Marvin Bagley. And unfortunately, once again, when they needed him, he was not available. I'll talk more about Marvin's injury and how it's kind of poetic, how it's symbolic of Marvin's career to this point. We'll talk about that. Plus, the Kings have one more game at home, a very winnable game against the Detroit Pistons. But after that, yikes, it gets ugly. And that might force the Kings, especially with Tyrese Halliburton out, to make a move maybe sooner than they wanted or risk really falling out of it. I'll talk about that more in just a little bit. Right now, though, I want to let you know today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by betonline.ag. Hey, maybe you were like me and you had one eye on this Kings and Rockets game today but the other eye and most of your brain and attention on the 49ers beating the Dallas Cowboys. Maybe you made money on either the Kings game or the Cowboys game. Whether you're betting on the NFL playoffs, betting on the NBA season, betting on college athletics, uh, UFC, boxing, uh, hockey, anything, make sure you're doing it at Bet Online. Bet Online would like to wish you a happy new betting year. They continue the march towards the playoffs in the NBA. We're in the playoffs in the NFL. Like I mentioned, Bet Online is the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022, and it's really not close. It's a new year. They have a new updated desktop and mobile website. If you go and sign up today and deposit money, you'll get an instant 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. So if you deposit $100, you get $50 free to bet with and to make money with all you have to do to get that bonus is use promo code locked on all one word l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n again from football to basketball hockey boxing ufc uh right to your favorite vegas casino games bet online has all of the uh, the gambling action for you for all of 2022 bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports bet online where the game starts marvin bagley had his best game of the season his first 20 point 10 plus rebound double double since May of 2021. I know it was against the Houston Rockets, and that you have to take that into account. It does not matter. He had his best game of the season, best game in a long time, and his game compared or paired up with De'Aaron Fox's game gave us all flashbacks, right? Of what we hoped and envisioned that De'Aaron Fox, Marvin Bagley pairing to be when the Kings drafted him Bagley number two overall in 2018. It is perfectly poetic. And it's fortunately, this is going to be a hard dose of truth, a hard dose of reality. And the uh, picking on Marvin Bagley is already low hanging fruit. So I'm really not trying to pick on the guy, but there's some brutal honesty needed here. It is fitting that after Marvin's best game of his season, best game in months, he goes down with injury. And remember, last season, Marvin had his best game of the season in Miami before going down with injury. This is the epitome of Marvin Bagley's career to this point. This is why Marvin Bagley is not reliable. This is why Marvin Bagley is in the position that he is in, in the NBA to this point, already being labeled a bust, being compared to others from that draft class and him not even being remotely close to the same level. After the good happens, the injuries come. It's not his fault. Although I question why he was not playing through shoulder soreness, which he was listed with. Now, I would have understood if it was a hand injury because I got to give Marvin credit. He has been playing through some, some injuries. And you saw that his hand has been taped up. He's had hand and thumb issues in the past. We know he, he's broken his hand early on in the 2019 season, 2019, 2020 season when DeAndre Ayton broke his hand on opening night. God, it feels like forever ago. I know he hurt his hand last season as well. And then in the Lakers game, LeBron James hurt his hand, uh, hurt Marvin's hand by, by slapping down at the ball late in that game. 
Like I know Marvin's been fighting through injuries. So had he missed this game with a hand injury, which maybe it would have been, they didn't clarify that, or maybe it was, and they didn't clarify that on the injury report. The injury report said shoulder soreness, which I mean, my right shoulder actually hurts right now from playing golf and sitting at a computer all day. I understand how it's uncomfortable to play through, but when you are going into a game without one of your best players in Tyrese Halliburton, and by the way, I didn't mention this, and I will talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the upcoming road trip. Losing Tyrese Halliburton might be harder for this team to overcome than losing De'Aaron Fox. I'll get into that more a little bit later. But when you see Tyrese Halliburton is out, Kings needed Marvin in this game. Kings desperately could have used Marvin, especially down the stretch when both Tyrese and De'Aaron Fox was out after Fox got ejected. But instead, Marvin's not playing because he's hurt again. Marvin Bagley is unreliable. When this team needs him, he is usually not there because of injuries. Again, no fault of his own, but this is a results league. And this has happened every single season of the young man's career. It's inexcusable. I'm sorry. It's just, it's inexcusable at this point. If it was like a one-time thing or every once in a while thing, we just chalk it up to, man, that's bad luck. And unfortunately, the Kings could have used him tonight, but he wasn't available, but it's Marvin Bagley, blah, 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 blah. That's not the case. When Marvin gets hurt, it's like, no surprise, here we go again. Unfortunately, that is how Marvin, his career, if his career ended today, that is how Marvin is going to be remembered. As the guy that had oodles of talent, and after he would make the slightest bit of progress or showcase how good he can be, he gets hurt. It's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate because the Kings desperately could use it. And again, it's it's tough love. It's not even love, really. It's just tough reality. It's hard truth. And I'm not blaming Marvin Bagley being out for the Kings losing this game, nor am I saying that Marvin owes it to the team to fight through those injuries and keep playing. Not saying that at all. If he wasn't good to go, he wasn't good to go. And I understand he's trying to protect his own self and his own investment going forward because he's trying to get paid and, and is more than likely going to another team where he's going to try and turn his career around. I understand not wanting to risk that. I get that. Truly, I do. I understand that completely, and I don't blame him for it. But Marvin and Marvin's camp, Marvin's family, Marvin's agent, they can't complain about how Marvin is treated by the Kings. They can't complain about where Marvin is at in his career when this continues to happen over and over and over again. The man is unreliable. And if you're unreliable, you have no shot of being effective compared to Buddy Heald, who is a loose cannon and gets the Kings in trouble a lot and has more than his fair share of issues, right? But Buddy Heald is reliable night in and night out, and that makes him a million times more valuable than Marvin Bagley. That's just the hard, tr hard truth of the matter. It sucks. It's a bummer. I wish Marvin the best. I hope he comes back sooner rather than later because the Kings are going to need him when they go on this East Coast road trip coming up. I'll tell you more about this road trip. Talk about the effect of losing Tyrese Halliburton on this road trip and why Monty McNair, his timeline for making a move might have been sped up a little bit with Tyrese going down. We'll get to that in just a second. Right now, though, I hope that you have taken the time and done yourself the favor by trying at least a built Bar. And if you've tried a built Bar and you don't like it, I'm not saying you're weird. I'm not saying you're different. Everybody has their own taste buds, right? But I am going to say that you're really missing out. And you should try more flavors of built Bar before you make a final decision. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. It comes in, in a multitude of incredible flavors. If you're a chocolate lover, a hearty lover, if you love um, like nuts, if you love fruit, it has so many different flavors available for you. And look, I know protein bars and protein-based products, they don't always taste like their flavor profile. Or maybe you get a hint of that flavor profile, but you mostly just taste the protein supplement or protein powder, right? That is not the case with Built Bars. Trust me, I am an extremely picky eater and I approve of Built Bars. If it gets my approval, it can get pretty much anybody's approval. I always recommend the mint brownie bar. It's the best, but try a bunch of different flavors. You will find at least one that you like and all Built Bars come 
uh, covered in 100% chocolate, soft, easy to chew, delicious. Uh, and there are only 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. So make sure you use a built bar to help you get those New Year's resolutions started off right. If you're trying to bulk up, uh, trying to eat healthier, trying to lose weight, built bar can help you help you with all of them and then some. Take it to the gym with you to help get you through that workout. Take it on a golf round. That's what I do all the time to get you through that uh, that back nine or those final few holes. Take it with you to work. Take it with you for lunch. Built bar bars are perfect at all times of the day. And when you order built bars on built.com, make sure you use our promo code locked 15 to get 15% or order or off your order rather. Again, that's promo code locked 15 for 15% off at built.com. The Kings have gone on one count them one three game winning streak this season. And they had a great chance of making it two and Honestly, it could have very well been their first four-game win streak of the season had they handled their business tonight against the Rockets with the Detroit Pistons coming into town next. Unfortunately, the Kings lose this one to the Rockets. And look, I know it's it's hard regardless of whoever team you're playing. It's the NBA. It's hard to beat a team twice in a row. I get that, especially when you're missing some of your best players. But Tyree Halliburton being out is another significant blow. And it's a significant blow that looking at this upcoming schedule could completely put the Kings out of the mix. It really could. Like, I'm not trying to over-exaggerate. The Kings are in a dangerous territory here looking at their upcoming schedule with how this team is reliant on Tyrese Halliburton. And being without Tyrese Halliburton is a massive blow. So much so, I honestly feel that the Kings being without Tyrese Halliburton is a bigger blow than the Kings being without De'Aaron Fox earlier in the season. That's not me saying that Tyrese is better than De'Aaron. What I am saying is I think to this team, with where they're at right now, Tyrese Halliburton is more important to the Kings. Not better, but more important. And you could argue that being more important is better than being better, right? But Tyrese is so crucial in how the Kings run their offense, especially half-court offense. The Kings are a bad half-court offensive team when Tyrese Halliburton is not in the game. So Tyrese going down puts a lot of weight on the shoulders of De'Aaron Fox and a lot of weight on everybody else to pick up some of that load. I think a lot of weight goes on the shoulders of Davion Mitchell. The playmaking has to still be there. The pick-and-roll success has to still be there. I know Rashawn Holmes is trying to impl- uh, get himself back into game shape. De'Aaron Fox and Rashawn Holmes need to find a way to make things work in the pick and roll significantly better than they have to this point. Not saying that they've been terrible, but comparing De'Aaron Fox and, Ty- and uh, Rashawn Holmes in the, in the pick and roll to De'Aaron, or to Tyrese Halliburton and Rashawn Holmes, night and day difference. No Tyrese Halliburton is really going to hurt this Kings team. Because after they host the Detroit Pistons on Wednesday, they have a couple of days off to get right. Although a couple of days is not going to be good enough for uh, Tyrese to to come out of health and safety protocols. Then they go on a long and rough Eastern Conference road trip to end the month of January. Milwaukee, Boston, Atlanta, Philly, New York. That could easily be 0-5 easily be 0-5. Not to mention, you have Brooklyn and Golden State the next two games to start February. Brooklyn in Sacramento and then at Golden State, which is the second night of a back-to-back after the Brooklyn game. Like, there is a very good chance that the Kings are staring 0-7 in the face over these next seven games. Now, we might want to give them one or two, but that's still 2-5. and And looking at the standings right now with where the Kings are in it, They're still very much in the conversation. Of course, it's going to take a lot for the Kings to fall out of the conversation. They're still just a game out of the final play-in spot, one game back of the Portland Trailblazers. But they're also only a game ahead of, or rather they're half a game ahead of both the Spurs and Pelicans in 12th and 13th. They're only two games ahead of the Thunder in 14th. And the Kings aren't that far ahead of the Houston Rockets who just won their 13th game. The Kings have 18 wins. Like, A one and six stretch puts the Kings at 19 and 24. That's not good. An 0 and seven stretch, of course, puts the Kings at 18 and 25 or 35. I'm sorry. Did I say 24? I meant 34. 18 and 35 if the Kings go 0 and seven during this stretch. And it's very, very possible. 
especially without Tyrese Halliburton. Guys have to step up. Now, I don't expect Tyrese to be out that entire road trip, although who knows? Health and safety protocols can be different for any player. Hopefully he comes back ASA freaking P. But with that stretch and the possibility of the Kings going 0-7 coming up, like the Kings have that entire road trip before the trade deadline. Actually, they have a lot more than that before the trade deadline because the deadline is the 10th. The Kings have, including the Detroit game, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 games before the trade deadline. And the majority of them are against good teams. They can be out of it by the time they get to the deadline. And Monty McNair said in a recent radio interview that this team is looking to make the playoffs and that's going to be the goal and that's going to be the approach coming to this trade deadline. You're not going to have a shot to make the playoffs potentially with Tyrese out going into this stretch. So I think Monty McNair's timeline might be accelerated a little bit. I think he needs to really consider if he's going to make a move, trying to find a way to accelerate it and make that move either before or at some point during that Eastern Conference road trip or things are going to get ugly very, very quickly. Or else he risks waiting too long and waiting for the Kings to basically fall out of it or put themselves in such a deep hole that even with roster improvements, they're going to be battling uphill and are going to need a lot of luck just to make it to the play-in, let alone make it out of the play-in and into the playoffs, which again has always been the goal. Just saying, not trying to be a Debbie Downer. My confidence is not very high with this team going on this road trip. Not at all. Where are you at? Let me know at Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me, mattgeorgesports at gmail.com, uh, or feel free to leave your thoughts down in the YouTube comment section down below. Kings have a couple days off, like I mentioned, before they host the Detroit Pistons. Got to win that game with the upcoming stretch, even without Tyrese Halliburton. Got to win that game. Also, speaking of Detroit, Cade Cunningham, I think, got ejected from tonight's game, too, for an absolutely silly technical foul after celebrating a little bit after a nasty dunk in a game where the 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 uh, uh, Pistons were losing by, like, 20 points or whatever to uh, the Phoenix Suns. Let the kid have his fun. So dumb. But he should be playing. The Detroit Pistons are not a pushover by any means, so the Kings will have to make sure they handle their business at home before going on this road trip. That's coming up on Wednesday. Before that... I will be doing that uh, that hypothetical what if the Kings were to completely blow it up and execute a long-term rebuild. What has to go right? All the questions this team has to ask and answer correctly. All that is coming up on the next podcast, so I hope you will join me for that. Until then, my name is Matt George. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time. You have been listening to Locked On Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.